Today we hear the words of the prophet Isaiah, calling the Israelites to attention for how they should repair the wreckage of their community. Let us listen for how his words land with us today. Shout out, do not hold back. Lip, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Announce to my people their rebellion and to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet day after day they seek me and delight to know my ways as if they were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake, forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. They ask, why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Look, you serve your own interest on your fast day and you oppress all your workers. You fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose? A day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush, to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the, of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin? Then your light shall break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for, Lord, for help and God will say, here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer instead your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like the noonday sun. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the, the restorer of streets to live in. the wisdom of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Let us also hear these words from the Gospel of Mark. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. For the good news of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. God,
God of the Jordan and the Galilee, of the people of Israel and Palestine, God of we who are Americans, for we who claim to walk in the paths of Christ, who seek to know your word. Be with us now that we may hear the words of the prophet, that we may enter into the waters of baptism, of cleansing and renewal, and that the words of our mouths and the meditations of all our hearts may be truly acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer, and let the people say, Amen. Today is the day that we traditionally hear this passage from the Gospel of Mark about Jesus and his baptism. And I wrestled this week with whether to include it. Like many of you, I've been weary this week, weary of the news, weary of continued unpleasantness that we witness, weary about what Wednesday did to the psyche of our nation. And I imagine you feel it too. I'm actually kind of curious what you're feeling in this moment, particularly as we reel from this week. If you feel like putting it in the chat, I welcome seeing it. We had a impromptu, somewhat impromptu vigil on Wednesday night in prayers, and it was good just to hear from one another. We also did the same in our council meeting, just about where we're at. And I realize that the news cycle has moved on and some of us have moved on as well. But I want to ref pause and reflect a little bit about where we are at right now in our country's history. Heartbroken and frightened, feeling mixed up, another person says. Sorrow, worried. Sad and settled yet open to what is next and, and vow to serve. Seething, horror and heartbroken, enraged, disappointed, confused, shaken, angry. Heartbroken, parched, also worried and angry. Lack of understanding one another anxious, exhausted. It is good for us to share these feelings, to share whatever burdens we may be having with one another. That's part of why we come to church together. It's also helpful for me as a pastor and preacher to know where we're, we are as a community. I wrestled this week about whether to express what I really think or whether to stay primarily pastoral and calming and trying to speak to our fears and anxieties, I hope to offer a combination of both. I believe that what we saw on Wednesday was an exacerbating symptom of a deeper problem in our nation. It's when the tumor started to show more clearly and in a more ugly fashion. And what we saw on Wednesday was not just about a person, but about a system a system that all of us participate in and many of us benefit from. But I do want to break with my usual format and talk just a moment about the person whom I consider a symptom, a product of this problem we all share. I have tried these past years to be responsible in my critique of our current president, not taking direct pot shots, but trying to speak as honestly as I know how, trying to hold up the real world in which we all live, with my understanding of the truth of the gospel. And our congregation's terms of covenant with its pastors is very explicit about pastoral leadership having, quote, freedom of expression in the pulpit as it pertains to matters of faith and faithfulness, according to the insight of scripture, the work of the Holy Spirit, the traditions of the United Parish and its three denominations and the context in which we live our lives. And I'm also keenly aware, as most clergy are, of the Johnson Amendment, an inclusion in the 1954 IRS Code introduced by then Senator Lyndon B. Johnson, which prohibits a church or other nonprofit from participating or intervening in, quote, any political campaign on behalf of or in opposition to any candidate for public office. In truth, only a handful of churches have ever been prosecuted under this law. 
Our current president vowed to get rid of this amendment, presumably allowing his conservative Christian supporters free reign in the pulpit to support him and his allies. And early on in his first year in office, he signed an executive order that lessens law enforcement around it. So in that spirit, I offer the following as a pastor seeking to follow the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have stated for, to us before that people who take their faith seriously, not just the Christian faith, but any faith, will inevitably have to take every other aspect of their life seriously, including their politics. The waters of baptism have a claim on us, a claim to speak truth and to follow Jesus. And politics is not something inherently dirty or secular. Politics is simply the business of how things get done. Politics is how power is distributed. And if we read our Bible closely, we will see that Moses, Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Jesus, Paul, they were all political people taking on the prevailing powers of their time in both word and deed, whether religious or governmental, because their ultimate sense of power came from a different source, the source of life, the core of their being, the divine creator. And occasionally I've heard concerns that we have not been inclusive enough, un enough from the pulpit to all political standpoints. And that is a very good and thoughtful critique. And I would certainly like to hear from any people in our congregation or who listen to us who support the president and why. But what I have to say is not about partisan politics. It's about human decency and basic morality. Regardless of whatever our thoughts are on tax policy, or the best way to handle immigration quotas, or our right contribution to NATO, or whether we should be a part of the World Health Organization or the Iran Nuclear Accord or the Paris Climate Agreement. And we could and should have principled debate on any of those issues on the grounds of how we understand and practice our Christian faith. But regardless of our thoughts on any of these issues, I have little, seen little to nothing Christian in this president's behavior. Despite the post-riot video on Wednesday, we have seen almost nothing that contains the spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, generosity, or self-control. Nothing about what it means to humble oneself in service of others. Nothing about loving your enemies. As one of my evangelical colleagues pointedly put it to me, he's not the Antichrist, but he is anti-Christ. And as I have heard plenty of parents and teachers express their concerns, it is imperative that we impress upon our children and youth that the kind of petulance, thin-skinnedness, bullying tactics, temper tantrums, blatant and relentless lying, and fits of ego that we have seen from this man are not the kind of behavior that mature adults, that real servant leaders practice. They are the behavior of a broken soul, of a psychologically and spiritually stunted person, they are the behavior of a bully. And this week we saw in very clear and painful ways how such irresponsible rhetoric fans the flames of division and bigotry and has fatal effects. We saw in real time that leadership matters, that words matter, that the content of our character matters. And we've watched over the past 25 years as politics in our nation's capital have been less about getting things done for the common good, about lifting up the vulnerable as Isaiah and pages and pages of our scriptures instruct us to do, less about helping the lame to walk and the blind to see, but about posturing and sloganeering and smearing. And our ship of state has become one big hulking, leaking, rusty mess foundering at sea most recently with a captain and lieutenants who have no real moral compass. We can do better. We should do better. And we must do better if this American experiment is to survive. We heard from august and well-meaning white people this past week, including our president-elect, that what occurred on the ellipse and later at the Capitol building is not America. As if, in the words of Isaiah, we were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of our God. Well, I wish that were true, but it is America. And too often we do forsake the ordinances of God. 
It is an America where white supremacy is still on the loose and has been emboldened these past four years. And in institutionalized racism is the, just the way we do business. It is an America where the poor keep getting poorer and the rich keep getting richer. It is an America where our sense of rugged individualism continues to eclipse any sense that we are in this together, that we are our siblings keeper, that our collective life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness is linked to each of our individual lives, liberties, and pursuits of happiness. And it is not merely a symptom of America of the fat past four years, but a long-standing America that subjugated and nearly annihilated the indigenous people who settled this land before white Europeans ever set foot here, forcing them eventually into dusty, windswept corners of the continent, surrounded by addiction and unemployment and lacking basic services. It is an America that forced into bondage and bought and sold people from the African continent and made an unholy deal in founding this nation that we would deem certain people three-fifths of a person based on the color of their skin. It is an America that has increasingly valued capitalism over democracy, too often on the backs of the enslaved and the poor and the incarcerated. It is an America that regularly and systematically defers to the financial bottom line before ever considering the moral bottom line. It is an America where we allowed ourselves to politicize public health, where in some states you can even tell how a person voted based on whether they will wear a mask. It is an America where we have undermined our conception of democracy and used the powerless as pawns in a corrupt political game. To quote one of our colleagues in the United Church of Christ, generations yet not, not yet born may never forgive us for what we did in this present to the unborn future. We should not and we cannot ignore these realities. As one prophet I read this week put it, we can only realize our strength when we stop whitewashing our sins. And yes, as someone who likes to lean into the side of hope, we have made advancements along the way. We have tried to expand our understanding of individual rights, but we have never fully atoned for the sins of our history. We have never fully righted our wrongs to form that more perfect union. And this is the ongoing the work that we have to do if we want to come in line with the God of whom Isaiah preaches. The God who tells us that we must loose the bonds of injustice, undo the thongs of the yoke, let the oppressed go free and break every yoke. That we must share our bread with the hungry, bring the homeless into our house, cover the naked, and not hide ourselves from our own humankind. What I describe is America, and yet as we all know, it is not all of America. There are still plenty of us who are willing with encouragement to see another point of view. There are still plenty of us who just want safe homes and neighborhoods to raise our families and enjoy our friends. There are still plenty of us who are willing to work together on common problems, like the work in our justice team to come together around affordable housing right here in our own community of Brookline. There are still plenty of us who welcome, who celebrate a diversity of voices, of races, of ethnic and religious backgrounds, of genders, all made in the image of God, embracing them to come together to contribute to the common good. We saw this week, and we should not forget, but we should celebrate that we saw in the state of Georgia, the first Jewish American senator from the South and an African American senator from Dr. King's home church. Can I get an amen? And there is our own governor here in Massachusetts who has managed the pandemic with kindness, with respect, with responsibility and resolve and Boston's mayor who will continue his commitment to working people in the new administration. And we saw in the last few weeks in trying to finally put together a sorely needed COVID relief bill in Congress, that a group of underreported bipartisan legislators known as the Problem Solver Caucus reached across the aisle to get things done. They need our encouragement and we need our media outlets to tell us more about them. Isaiah would call them repairers of the breach. 
restorers of the streets to live in. The real tragedy to me of Wednesday is that many, if not most of the people who came to the protests and those who stormed the Capitol are clearly frustrated by a broken system as well. They are clearly angry about economic disenfranchisement. Now, I've been a part of protests and demonstrations on the National Mall. I know what fuels us to come there and be seen and heard. But what is tragic is that they put their faith in a leader who believes that strength is in vilifying others, a leader who takes legitimate human concerns of his constituents, of a failed economy, of a sense of loss, of countless untold and unnecessary deaths because of mismanagement of a virus. And rather than show them how to be constructive parts of the solution, feeds them buckets of lies and whips them up into a fury. Not the only leader who does that, but one of the most important. So what does our faith require of us in moments like this? What do we need to be as to become repairers of the breach, of restorers of the streets to live in? Looking out on this Zoom crowd, on this congregation, just as I did on Wednesday night, I do believe that many, if not all of us, are part of this solution already by the way we live our lives, by the jobs that we participate in in serving others, of helping one another, by the way we practice community here, that we are an example of the ways that God wants us to work in the world. But the question is, how do we expand that into the nation, into the body politic? That's the question that houses of faith, like all of ours, have to keep asking ourselves. And so what of baptism, this story we hear of Jesus meeting his wild-haired cousin in the Jordan River? As you know, we have only two sacraments in this church, that of baptism and communion, sacraments which are known as the outward signs of the inward grace of God symbolic acts that represent what we claim God is doing and can do at a deeper level. And as we've seen this week in our nation's capital, symbols matter, whether statues or speakers podiums or flags that show one's real allegiance or architecture that inspires us to lofty ideals. These symbols point us to larger truths and the symbols of our faith matter. Having grown up Baptist, I appreciate hearing this story because it reminds me of immersion, of being fully dunked. And as much as I always enjoy our baptism of little children as we do in our Congregationalist and Methodist tradition, there is something for me that feels a little precious about the sprinkling of a baby. There is something of danger of being completely dunked in the water to trust on the strong arms of someone who is beside you in the faith, to remember that there is sometimes danger as we wade into the water. The water is never predictable. We can't always see the bottom of it. We can't always see what is swimming around among us. But we know in the cleansing waters of baptism, we are reminded that we are precious, each one of us in God's sight, that we are worthy of the calling to which Jesus has called us, a calling of love and justice inextricably linked together, of speaking truth and living into God's kind of future. Baptism puts a claim on us. I've sometimes wondered if rather than just marking ourselves with the sign of cross with water that dries out, if we put a tattoo or some sort of marking on ourselves that we remember it all the time, what would that do to our faith? What sort of sense of danger and resolve would it remind us? See, Paul let us know what a Christian looks like, what a Christian acts like. A Christian is one who follows in the gospel of love and, ju and justice as preached by this rabbi Jesus of Nazareth. This kind of person, a Christian, is patient, is kind, is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude, does not insist on their own way. When we come out of the waters of baptism, we commit to these values that we are not irritable or resentful, that we do not rejoice in wrongdoing, but we rejoice in the truth, that we will bear all things, that we will believe all things, we will hope all things, and we will endure all things. 
And Paul calls us to learn to put away childish things and childish behavior and to act like adults. This is our calling today as it is every day, perhaps with more intensity. I'm not exactly sure of what the best strategies are going forward. I know that I'm reaching out to my friends who are working on the Unify America Project. I'm beginning to wonder how much we can be a part of the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization to work for the values here locally and nationally that we care about. But I do know we all need to pray. We need to pray that God will lead us in ways of healing, of humility, of hope, of listening, of building up one another. We need for God to satisfy us in our parched places, to make our bones strong, that we may help God water the garden, a spring of water whose waters never fail, that we may rebuild the ancient ruins and raise up the foundations of many generations. Let us get to work. Amen.